This episode of the PC Perspective Podcast is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price, because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash PCPer and enter code PCPer. Hey, everybody. Welcome to PC Perspective. Blah. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode number 475, being recorded November 8th, 2017. I'm Alan Melventano. I'm Jeremy Hallstrom. I'm Raja Kadori. No, you're not. <laughs> okay, I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Ken Addison. Yeah. We don't have Raja on the podcast quite yet. Even though, who knows? He might just end he, up showing up at the door yeah, right there. At the, you never know. We don't know what's if going on. If we start on. looking in that direction... During the podcast. If we look in that direction and one of us busts out like some bourbon and some cigars and stuff like that, I guess. Isn't that what usually happens? Just show up the door with his Super Saiyan hair. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It'll be good times. Uh, Yeah. So uh, we're doing a podcast like we do every week. Ryan is on travel to various things, shenanigans, whatever. He's on work related. Super secret mission. Super secret missions. (laughs) Multiple super secret missions from what I understand. Yeah. Podcast at PCPro.com. If we do we even check that email? No. Oh. No one checks it. You so, should still uh, send an email there, but we're not going to check it. Well, that's that's nice. That's good. Okay. Um, PCPro.com slash podcast or PCPro.com slash ra- or Twitter.com slash Ryan's route. Twitter.com slash PCPro. All those links and places to follow and whatnot. And um, yeah. So let's jump into the stuff. We have a piece per mailing list. If you're on it, you would not have gotten an email this week. <laughs> Apologies for that. Ken dropped the ball. Uh, we will. Uh, those responsible have been sacked. And we will. Oh, uh, thank God, finally. <laughs> I've been trying to quit this place for years. Uh, Patreon.com slash PC per is where you can. Help us, uh, I don't know, keep the lights on, stuff. Things like that. You know, we're doing the mailbag. Uh, Jim, are we up coming up on the storage mailbag? Well, if Ryan's not back, uh, when does he come back? Uh, Friday. Uh, yeah, Friday. Oh, so then, yeah, you're up this week. Well, when is, I, when stay we... tuned, ladies and gentlemen. We've been doing it for four months. We've got a very special episode starring Alan. Did you save up four months for the storage questions? Uh, yeah, pretty much anything that was specifically up your alley, I've been setting aside. Great. So it's going to be three months worth of old, outdated storage questions. No, and storage hasn't changed that much. Yeah. Recent ones. We'll, we'll, we'll get it, we'll get something sorted out. And if we if we run short, we'll just have you dance for the camera for oh. twenty minutes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or I'll bust out the racing wheel and you know record <laughs> record another one of those uh, videos. <sighs> All right, uh, is that what's next? Yeah, PC Per Plays. Or no, that was a mailbag, too. Oh, that's not, uh, that's not queued up. Well, it looks like a mailbag video. There was a, there was a PC Per mailbag. Which Ryan talks into his webcam. <laughs> yes, Ryan did talk into the webcam uh, and, and give funny he looks. He was very, very pleased with <laughs> his talking to the webcam <laughs> give, this week, Give I funny think. looks to the webcam. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, he did, uh, you know, answered a bunch of questions there. Uh, we also did a PC Per Plays, where Ken... Uh, Vaulted play- off some buildings Ken successfully and Edge. both not uh, successfully. Yeah, Ken played Mirror's Edge uh, quasi-badly. But, you know, it was still fun to watch. Made it, like, almost halfway through the game. And, yeah, as it turns know? out, we were, like... Past the halfway point, I yeah, think. Which I thought was funny. We were looking at the speedrunner, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> times beforehand, and uh, it it's was, like, wait a minute, we were at that mission. <laughs> yeah, it was like you know, twenty minutes to to beat the game. No, I don't want to restart now. Windows, snooze. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, well, let's uh, get into the week in review. First up, that, that one. Intel announces new CPUs integrating AMD Radeon graphics. Holy crap. Why would they do such a thing? I mean... Because their graphics suck. Well, yeah. They there's need that. better graphics. There's that. You know who has good graphics? AMD. Well, these are supposed to still AMD's also good. have the Intel graphics. Mm-hmm. But they're just tacking on. But it's on. not... 
Yeah. They're, just they're just for low power functional. reasons. No, they are functional. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're supposed to oh, work. Okay. Yeah, it's supposed to be able to switch back and forth just mm-hmm. as if it was like a, you know, discrete added on GPU. Yeah. And a, so, so you'll still have quick sync and stuff like that. And for 2D tasks, as, as far as I know, it'll use the HD graphics still. Yep. But they basically are making a pretty huge uh, interposer style, you know, uh, interconnect that close board thing. Yeah. Like just put it all in a okay, module. So, so basically. It's, it's essentially a substrate, a regular substrate, except that Intel has this technology called EMIB and embedded multi-die interconnect bridge. So basically, they embed and what is essentially a sliver of an interposer in the PCB and lay the chips on top of that. So you've got both uh, regular bumps from the PCB and then bumps from this semi-interposer thing, the silicon bridge. And so the, the advantage of this is it's less expensive to make. It doesn't affect the Z height of that, and uh, the bridges are are less complex in that you don't have all of these through vias that the uh, the interposer typically does. So it's a smaller piece of silicon. You only kind of etch stuff on the top rather than do through uh, a bunch of vias, and it all just kind of works. And it it's less expensive to put together. So that's what EMIB is. So now I've seen some back and forth on this. As far as we know, EMIB is probably only being used to connect the HBM2 to the GPU, not the GPU to the CPU, correct? That's that's the assumption. We don't know if that is correct or not. Um, Since, I mean, Intel with mobile processors has been doing the CPU and a PCI Express-ish link to the chipset for a while now, so mm-hmm. that should be... A technology they understand. Yeah, and, and, and I mean that's it's that's something that the uh, the regular PCB can handle perfectly fine. I mean, since PCI Express runs to your motherboard, which is a giant PCB, it's not going to be a problem for that substrate to be able to handle that, especially when uh, the chips are as close as they are, and they just put some caps and resistors in there and whatnot, and and uh, have it all connect nicely. So yeah, I bet it's either a by four or a by eight. PCIe 3.0 connection to that GPU. Again, this is a mobile part, 15 to 35 watt TDP so far. We don't know if they're going to go higher or lower, but so, you know, bandwidth is, you know, it's big, but it's not huge. So, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to find out more details about this, but there was a lot of speculation i mean kyle bennett about a year and a half ago said hey intel and amd are working on a joint graphics thing and everybody flew up in arms and it could never happen and it's just not going to work and you're just full of it and turned out he's right and uh (laughs) dang it all those other things are still true but he was also still correct (laughs) yeah yeah but um the things that we're confused about is, was AMD just licensing this to Intel? Was Intel going through semi-custom like Microsoft and Sony did, where you know they, they uh, contracted semi-custom, they licensed it, and then they produced the chips themselves to integrate into their uh, consoles? Because AMD does not sell individual chips to the console makers. I mean, they they... They get the designs. They go to either Global Foundries or TSMC. In this case, both of them go to TSMC. They produce them themselves. They have their own wafer agreements. And uh, that's how that works. Well, this case is a little different. Uh, Intel contracted through the semi-custom group, but AMD actually produces the chips and then sells them to Intel. Now, these are specialized in what we assume to be Polaris chips uh, because, you know, Polaris doesn't uh, integrate the Infinity Fabric that Vega does. Intel obviously does not need nor want Infinity Fabric. And, of course, uh, AMD is, is not going to license that technology to them. So the good assumption here is that it's 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 the Polaris GPU. Um, it's not a top-end part, but it does integrate HBM to point oh two memory so they've got lower power memory 
They've got a much smaller PCB that they have to work with. And all of this fits in one kind of nice package. Now, guys like Apple and uh, all of these uh, guys who are wanting to make gaming machines that are smaller form factors are, are just salivating after this because it's nicely integrated. It's compact. You could do all kinds of things with that form factor. And uh, performance-wise, it looks pretty good. So the leak is in between a 1050 Ti, a standalone GTX 1050 Ti mobile, and a GTX 1060 mobile. So that's that's some horsepower. That's hit the really yeah. good sweet spot for what uh, AMD and Intel have have worked together to do. They've been apparently working with each other for quite a long time to get this. So we can imagine that this particular partnership will go on for some years. Will it last forever? I doubt it. Yeah, so not Especially as Especially with news that's coming later on. Not only is it giving you that, well, leaked <laughs> performance, but supposedly, you know, seems reasonable. Seems like a reasonable leak, like it could definitely be there. But you're getting that performance and, uh, you know, that small of a package, right? Like nothing, there's no NVIDIA thing that can compete. So you're saying with it's not the of, size of the boat, it's the motion of the ocean, Yeah, right? basically. But there, there's nothing <laughs> exactly. NVIDIA has that can compete on uh, for that amount of PCB space, basically. Uh, for, for, you know, a mobile style uh, module that you would, you know, that you would just integrate into whatever, into whatever yeah. thing you want. Yeah. And so because of the TDP and, and the capabilities, you can you can put it into all kinds of form factors, whether or not it's going to be able to fit into a nook. I, I we're not sure yet. Probably <laughs> not. But maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, mean they could fit in a nook. Well, but, yeah. a well, nook is traditionally heat, about, but maybe. Uh, a nook yeah. is traditionally so, the 15 watt CPUs, and this is more in the 35 watt range. But yeah. they have done higher power nooks. Yeah, so a nook can dissipate it, uh, like 30, skull 40 watts. Trail yeah. One? Yeah. 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 Skull Canyon too. Skull Canyon, so, yeah. yeah. Not yeah, only that, Canyon. I mean, the heatsink is that much of an easier proposition. Assuming Intel can make these with all the chips at the same level, <laughs> uh, you know, other than the weird issues that we're running into with uh, the Vega parts. Yeah, I just throw it in a bridge port. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, cool stuff. Now, did Lisa was it Lisa Sue who put a Twitter basically saying that AMD and Intel are not competing in this space you know the the raven ridge is a a different market segment than this new hybrid they're coming out with i Correct. mean yeah because the raven ridge is is going to be a 15 to 35 watt tdp and it's kind of just an all-in-one smaller package and your performance is not going to reach what this one does because raven ridge relies on the ddr4 memory um that the laptop tablet or whatever you know form factor they decide to do uh, handles while this has hbm2 uh, there's going to be a significant price difference in between the top end raven ridge part and even just the low end version of this one i mean that's a much larger package it's a lot more silicon hbm2 is not inexpensive yet they would like it to be but it's not so it's it's going to be, I mean, they're not competing there in terms of money, in terms of TDP, and in terms of performance. And so that's a win for Intel and AMD. Now, AMD is competing with the, uh, what is it, the 8700U or 7700U. I can't remember what the exact mobile SKUs are. But that's kind of what they're looking at, the integrated Intel graphics with the... Um, Cabby Lake, and uh, yeah, I don't think the they don't have a Coffee Lake yet, do they? No, no, the no, eight thousand no. for for the fifteen watt notebooks is Cabby Lake Refresh, the quad core stuff. Aha, gotcha. Yeah. There's too damn many code names and products out there. You're telling me they're getting far too close brain. together. Can't keep it together. Uh, Technoscope in the chat brings up a good point. Like you're one step away from just throwing the storage on there. You know, yeah, and basically just having throw some RAM on there, regular RAM storage. Although, although in the chat they were talking about like, what if you just threw Crosspoint on there? And I don't think we're we're not to the point yet where you can just throw a Crosspoint and attach it to a CPU without um, a controller in the middle. <laughs> so yeah, but I mean, you know, that would be the next logical step, right? Just have uh, 
Have some RAM. Have then some. Uh, at some point, your CPU substrate just is as big as your motherboard. Well, <laughs> the CPU becomes you know, the motherboard. If you're using that backplane, it's a system on a chip. Yeah, if you're using that, yeah. well, it's a, it's a big chip. It's a system on a PCB. <laughs> so, in other words, it's a computer, <laughs> like a regular. No, but you know, be much smaller, um, especially if you were stacking like they already stack Flash in HBM style. Yeah, not mass produced yet, like with TSVs going through it, but like they're talking about getting getting there so they can go 16 high and 32 high, right? Um, they just need to do the completely through PCB via as like the new iPhone. They can just stack 3D. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll do that. And eventually it gets to the point where, you know, if one little part of your computer goes bad, you're just throwing away the whole dang computer because it's all... Some would argue uh, we're yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. I, I would argue we're already there. <laughs> At least with some computers. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up. Raja Kadori leaves AMD and joins Intel to build discrete graphics. Holy crap. Well, it's going to be more than just discrete <laughs> graphics. Well, um, you know, I, I had something that I think I just said uh, Raja Kadori leaves AMD and joins Intel. But but Ryan had to put himself, his, his two cents in. <laughs> And he, and he expanded upon that to build discrete graphics. Now, while that's true, and Intel admitted it as such, he's going to be doing a lot more there. And we kind of have to look at Intel before this, where they were heading, and where the, the industry, in fact, is going. And, and there are some pretty significant gaps. Um. They needed to do something serious. Their their visual compute group is trouble. I mean, it has been trouble. They and being it's which because company? it's been which company are you talking What's about? What's that? Which company are you talking Intel. about? Okay. BCG is or uh, uh Yeah, Visual Computing Group. That's that's Intel. Now they've changed that to Core and Visual Computing Group, and now Raja is the head of that. But before that it kind of was the redheaded stepchild of Intel. Um, they did some interesting things. They kind of were hidden above <coughs> their weight bracket. But they just never could get past some of the issues that Intel has when it comes to graphics. Now, many, many years ago, Intel needed to get into the graphics market. So they acquired the graphics division of Lockheed that was making the Starfighter 3D graphics chip. Um, Intel got a hold of that. They totally redid it. Not so much the graphics portion, but this was going to be their premier 2D, 3D card that would introduce AGP to the world. So it was an AGP 2X part with full fast writes and sideband memory, um, it's in it, what the sideband addressing, and it was it was the lead product. It had all of the features that AGP was was you know supposed to be the second coming of 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 PCI, and was going to be great. And they didn't have to have as big of a frame buffer because this sideband addressing and these fast writes and all that would all of that stuff would be in main memory. But AGP was so fast and low latency that you didn't need the frame buffer. Well, the i740 was what finally that was the Starfighter 3D. In terms of 2D and 3D, it was pretty decent, but it was about a year later than it needed to be. The competition had caught up to it and gone past it by the time it had been released. Certainly, you know, a lot of the competition had like AGP 1X parts or AGP 2X without fast writes or sideband. Um, you know, the compatibility of, of in between chipsets and graphics card was really, really terrible. And so uh, Intel, they then took this technology and then they kind of shrunk it down and put it in chipsets. And then they just kind of put these guys in the corner and said, every once in a while, we're going to need some graphics technology. You've got to enhance the features so that we're, you know, DirectX compatible. But we're not going to put a lot of money your way. We're not going to put a lot of manpower. You just kind of have what you got and just keep giving us the juice. And that kind of makes sense because Intel is an x86 company. 
their bread and butter is x86 performance. The amount of research and development they do on x86 is tremendous. I think it's been described to me that whenever a competition comes with something, Intel has the resources, and they actually have a lot of research already done that they just kind of sprinkle this research into their next generation processor, whether it's you know a year away or two years away, whatever, and, and they get one of those big jumps that we've been hoping and expecting for just because they've done a tremendous amount of research. But GPU has not been that. Uh, we now see... You know, NVIDIA really pushing AI. We see them pushing automated driving. We we see them do machine learning. All of this stuff with their graphics, they're investing a tremendous amount of software and hardware support into these new things. And not just gaming, not just, you know, pixels being painted on PC monitors. And I think Intel is kind of seeing the sign of the times. And for a while there, Intel was really kind of even no more pushing their their uh, visual compute guys away. And that obviously is not paying dividends for them. And it's a bad idea. And so we see them kind of change around. Uh, they they made this, uh, this agreement with uh, AMD to have a better part uh, for, for their kind of the gaming stuff. Somebody trying to say something or is it just a strange echo in my ear? Nothing here. Just in your head, I think. Well, that's a lot of stuff in my head. <sighs> but anyway, so they're, they, they've they got this new thing with AMD. Uh, they know the graphics are not where they should be. I mean, I've heard some other stories uh, in and around that, that you know, the CP guys have, have really just kind of kept them again in the corner because... In terms of graphics, Intel just hasn't been there. And we've seen AMD try to put out, you know, heterogeneous computing. We've seen NVIDIA do a lot of the C++ AMP and a lot of the other kind of stuff to, to get more workloads being done on their graphics. And they've done very well there. Uh, HPC stuff, there's some specialized things going on. Um, and they kind of control that market right now. And Intel kind of, I, I think they finally see the writing on the wall that they can't hold it back. They've tried to put all this work on x86 because they have such a lead there and they only have one competitor in that market. But now, you know, Nvidia is, is pushing really hard and GP, GPU stuff. AMD is, is, you know, a second behind there. They're not nearly as close to Nvidia as, as they probably want to be, but there's so many workloads that really hand uh, uh, leverage GPUs, so much better than x86. And I think finally it has gotten through to Intel as like, you know, we, we do have great x86 technology. We've got the best CPUs, best IPC, uh, you know, our multi-threading capabilities, our manufacturing is, is fantastic. But we have a large area that we're missing out in terms of automotive, in terms of AI, in terms of machine learning. All of these things where they've tried to shoehorn some of this stuff onto x86, but they just... They, they just don't have the throughput that like a GPU does in, in some of these workloads. So it seems like the power is now, maybe not so much the power is now going, but they're trying to embrace the GP, GPU stuff and they're bringing Raj in and he's hopefully for them going to be the guy who can kind of put it all together and get them on the right track because the future is not just x86. I mean, you can do all of these, you know, dozens of cores in there but there are overheads in x86 that you just can't get around. And there are things that G GPUs just do so much better. And it's all it's all just design. It's all ISA. And so it looks like, finally, Intel is going to start heading in this direction. Uh, because for the past 10 years, when we've tried to been going into this more GP, GPU stuff, Intel's been kind of a roadblock. It's not been in their interest to invest time in software, to invest time in, in developer relations, um, to try to get this stuff off the ground because they didn't have a competitive part. They didn't believe that there was a competitive part to their x86 products. So we're now getting to the point where, yeah, NVIDIA is doing really well. AMD's 
doing some really interesting things as well. I mean, they've got the base technology there. They just need a little bit more money and support to, to be able to, to make that jump to where NVIDIA is. And I think Intel's finally, finally realizing that. So we've seen, um, you know, Raj, I think he was burned out from AMD. I think they put a lot on his shoulders for the past three years. And definitely for the last two years, I, I doubt he's had much of a vacation. If anything, mm. um, he didn't show up for the Vega launch. I think that probably shows a few things uh, going on there. He took a sabbatical, took some time off. I think he got an offer that he just didn't feel that he could refuse. And, uh, you know, the future is going to be interesting. Uh, will Intel really be able to get past not being focused on x86? Will they be able to provide the the software support, the, the manpower, the design will to do these things? Are, are they going to be able to put out a generation of product and then have some negative reviews or or have not as much money as they expect come in? And will they have the willpower to to stay that course to be able to say, hey, okay, here's what we did wrong. Here's where we're deficient. We need to fix this. And in two years, we're going to be much stronger and we can we can take on you know more of the companies around this. It's 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 gonna be a big question about what Intel is willing to do and what they have the fortitude to do. Anybody have any other comment suggestion other than me just running my mouth dry? <laughs> I mean, I think uh, we're going to have a longer discussion about this probably next week. Wait, Ryan, you mean this is the only time we're going to talk about this? When Ryan's back. Well, well like, I mean, you know, we kind of need to you know. He's the one He's the one that, like, you know, can pick up the phone and just call Roger. <laughs> so, and then not tell us. And then not tell us anything. Yeah. Which is probably yeah. what but happened I, to Ryan. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm not so much sure it's the question of fortitude in a way, because Intel is sitting in such a lovely position that they they can literally throw money to problem just to see if it sticks to the wall. True. Uh, And and the group that Raj is going to be working with, uh, it's going to be probably an order of magnitude larger than anything he ever had at RTG. So, you know, in a way, that's got to excite a man to say, you know, I've been working so hard, but with limited resources for so long and look what I've done. And now I'm going to have Intel's resources yeah. to work, not just not on game, gaming computing or just general GPU stuff, but the, the new high power computing and stuff that uh, NVIDIA definitely is challenging and AMD is starting to challenge with. I, I think he's going to have a lot of fun. Well, well I mean, it, he's going to, it's going to be a process because, the yeah. basis of engineers on the GPU group is nothing like what he had in RTG yet. So they're going to have to recruit. They're going to have to hire new people. And they're going to have to get kids out of college. Uh, and they're going to have to train. And they're going to have to work really hard to get to a level of competency with a large, high-performing GPUs. That It's not going to be an overnight thing. It's not like he's being thrown in the sandbox and he's got all kinds of wonderful toys. He's got twice the playground that he ever had at AMD. That's it's not it's not unfortunately the way Intel has worked so far with graphics. But the the potential is there. They've got the money. They can hire people. They can transfer people into that group. They got they the can, fabs. Yep. They've got fabs. Yep. So give it's him a brand new you know, bright potential team of kids. Yeah. Yeah, the although potential, I, I guarantee potential you, is there, but it's going to be a process. Yes, but, and I guarantee you that in six to eight months, we are going to be seeing commenters screaming about how this was the stupidest thing ever, and Intel is never going to do it because <laughs> they haven't created brand new silicon within a year. Of course. Yeah. It, it's going to happen. It's, of course there will be. I want to see what happens. We can call that right now. Know, 18 months down the road, two years down the road. That's where I'm interested in. You need even longer than that, because that would be the first product that's when we start to see things yeah and you're assuming that there's already a team ready to start designing as soon as he gets there for it to be 18 well no as josh says uh, there's not going to be right but there's going to be the manpower or at least the resources to get the manpower to do it well it's it's interesting because intel has a lot of great really smart gpu engineers but that's true i just I, i just i don't think they're allowed to do anything yeah, there's that too. I, I mean, think that's like, I think that's the, the minus that he's going to run into. Like, you have more freedom with a smaller company and a smaller group. 
right? This there's is a, true. There's a lot more minutia and just kind of, you well, know. Well, and, and just like if Intel doesn't decide that graphics is somewhere that they place an emphasis like they haven't in the past 10 years or whatever, then they're not going to let the graphics team have yeah. the budget they need and have the resources they need. I, I don't so think, I don't think Roger, if, if they're doubling think Roger down would have on that, if like, yeah, you know, you know, but now if they're doubling down on that, those yeah. engineers can finally get to work. Right. I would imagine that question came up in the talk. <laughs> <laughs> like you guys don't really have much of a priority on graphics. Why are you hiring me? You know, oh, well we actually want a priority in graphics. You know, you can see that going down. So, I mean, Josh, it, it, it sounded like you were kind of going a little bit deeper into this, reading between the lines more than what I've been reading in the news. I mean, it sounds like this is more of a, a complete fundamental shift in Intel's priorities and not just a, oh, we're going to make better mobile GPU integration. Correct. You know, it, it does sound like that they are finally going to embrace a more heterogeneous, and, and this is me just speculating. But it makes sense because x86 all the time just it's not good for everything. I mean, we 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 look at Larrabee, and it was all a bunch of x86 processors with these wide vector units attached to them, and it just didn't perform, and it ran incredibly hot, and it was just really inefficient at what it did, and there was too much stuff that was just programmable rather than you know. Uh, some dedicated hardware that did one thing and it did one thing really, really well and really, really efficiently. Uh, you know, they had added, you know, like a handful of texture units to Larrabee because that was one thing that was, you could do very, very simply. If you design the hardware around it, it was complex and troublesome and slow. If you did it <laughs> programmable through the CPU and, and the vector units, I mean, it's just, it was a bad situation and they have to learn from this, and I think that they have, and they're going to have guys like Raj, and they're going to hire other people on there who will say, you know, here's a different way of looking things. Here's something that we can be uh, synergistic with rather than antagonistic. I mean, they eventually have to let go of being the x86 guy and... They can still be x86 guy and have the best IPC and multi-core solutions out there. But that's not going to be enough as, you know, ARM is getting into this. Uh, they're more interested in heterogeneous. Their partners are being more interested in that. NVIDIA is pushing their ARM and GPU in the autonomous driving uh, stuff and in AI learning, machine learning, all of these things. And Intel probably, you know, looked and said, you know, we're falling behind. Mm. Yeah, we have an advantage now, but that's not going to last forever. And unless we start pivoting where we're at, we're going to fall behind. We may have these great CPUs, but eventually the software world with all of these, you know, I mean, you're going to sell a couple million cars a year. Um I mean, you're going to have security systems that will utilize, you know, facial recognition and all these AI and machine learning stuff. I mean, it's just billions of parts that will be sold each year in in this, you know, Internet of Things and and automated um, areas that Intel will just be kicked out if they can't perform at the price and level that they're expected to be. Mm. And and this isn't their first attempt we've seen in the past. 18 months to a year of desperately trying to get in those markets with the acquisition of Mobileye, with the acquisition of Nirvana and launching the Nirvana AI chip at the end of this year. Like they're, they're desperately trying to get in this market. And I think this is just another piece of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it kind of seems like those other areas were band-aids. Yeah, exactly. Because they did mm -hmm. not have a central huge push into one direction. I'm like, well, we need some of this. And so they throw it in the mix. We need some of this. But they didn't have a philosophy that would embrace all of those things and to be able to give it equal time and space to their x86 business. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, an, an outside guy who sometimes reads some magazines. 
doesn't know very much, maybe talks to a person now and then. But that's what it seems like to me, that they've got to get their base philosophy away from their their core expertise. Otherwise, they're going to be left behind. And hiring Raja and getting into these other areas with a little bit more flexibility will help until stay relevant for decades to come. All right. Or at least they hope. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, speaking of like people making chips and stuff. Um, no, no. Um, read the screen. What? Oh, they don't make, they don't make chips. Oh, we no. can't, yeah. No, we can't don't. go there yet. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to turn it over. You're not to eat the chips on the bed either. I, I'm going to turn it over don't to resident, uh, resident Casper expert, Jim. Hello. Who owns multiple Casper mattresses. Yeah, so uh, today's show, today's episode of the PC Perspective Podcast is brought to you by Casper, as Alan said. And uh, let, me, let me tell you guys a story. Um, so this is, this is a, uh, you know, a Hey, ad. Jim. Hey, Jim. Yes. Can you tell us a story? Yes, I'm going to tell Ooh, you a story. story time with Jim. Story time. Uh, it just, I've got my marshmallows out. If you could fall out. asleep, uh, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> so this is, a, this is a paid ad, but my story isn't. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, I was listening to the PC Perspective Podcast. I didn't work here. I mean, I still don't technically really work here, but I just kind of squatted for a while. But uh, I was uh, at our old house. I was listening to the podcast, and, and the problem is I'm a big, big guy. My wife isn't. We kind of got like a Fred and Wilma Flintstone thing going on. Your wife is and, not a guy, yes. Correct. Well, she's not a big person. She's oh, okay. a very skinny, attractive redhead. I'm a big, fat brunette. So uh, <laughs> it's, starting next year. It's hard to, uh, yeah, next on Fox. <laughs> um, it's hard to find a mattress that fits. You know, we, we, we've had a variety of mattresses in our, in our marriage, and uh, it was hard to find one that fit both of our, you know, it was comfortable to both of us. So I was listening to the PC Perspective podcast maybe 18 months ago. And I heard an ad for Casper, this this company that somehow said they would ship you a mattress through the internet. So I said, "Oh, let me try that out." So we bought one, um, and we love it. I mean, it's it's great. They they will uh, you go online. They offer a variety of mattress sizes, and they they started as a mattress company. They're really evolving into sort of like a sleep company because they offer uh, bed sheets, pillows, bed uh, mattress support frames, uh, all that stuff you need. Uh, but we got the mattress. It worked for both of us. Uh, they're designed and manufactured in the USA. They are uh, memory foam, multiple types of memory foam. They create just the right bounce, just the right uh, sink to be supportive. They're breathable so you don't get hot. Um, and, and they're really, they're comfortable for, for all types of people. Uh, my, like I said, my wife and I went through three mattresses prior to the Casper and we either one of us liked it and the other didn't and it was just kind of back and forth. The Casper is one we can both settle on. Uh, and it's and it's really been great. Um, so, like I said, they they ship it to your house, and they've got a one hundred night trial. So, if you're concerned about buying a mattress in a store, if you're concerned about just trying to decide on this major purchase that you're going to spend a lot of time on in fifteen minutes in front of a, cre- a creepy store mattress salesman, have them ship it to your home. Try it for a hundred nights. If you don't like it. Just tell them, and they will come, and you don't have to try to get it back in the box. They will come and just take it from you and, and return it and give you your money back. Uh, it's really a uh, fantastic way to tell if this mattress is for you, and based on my experience, I, th- I think you're really going to like it. Uh, so to check it out, go to casper.com slash PCPer, and use the promo code PCPer, and you'll get 50 bucks off your uh, mattress purchase. Uh, since we bought that first one, we've bought two more, uh, and, and at full price, not because I'm associated with this or anything. Uh, we, 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 well, I use the PC per code, so not technically full price. I say 50 bucks, uh, just like you should. <laughs> so, so check that out. Terms and conditions apply. Again, that's casper.com slash PC per check it out. Uh, check out all their mattresses, their, their sheets. We, we've, I haven't tried their pillows, but their sheets are really good. Uh, and we bought one of their bed frames too. And it was really easy to put together and real supportive. Uh, so check that out. Casper.com slash PC per offer code PC per, and we thank Casper so much for their support of the PC perspective podcast. All right, cool. It's a dangerous website for me to go to because I need I need to make, you make are, some purchases uh, yeah. in, in this in this particular area. Hey, is that just a yeah? So, is that just a box spring or yeah? They they do box springs too apparently. Well, Sweet. like it, it's it's it looks like it's a frame with slats on yeah, the box yeah, yeah. spring. But I wonder if there's storage under that. It, it's really uh, hard to compress those, so it's got to it. be coming in pieces. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. just throw so a couple yeah, hard drives under. Assemble the frame, but like that it, looks it really actually easy. very intelligent in the way that it assembles. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, little, a little better than IKEA, maybe. Pretty good. Yes, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, uh, now that I've, I'm over my out of order execution, as the chat said, um, now we can talk about some CPUs uh, from Qualcomm. And they're not like CPUs that go in your phone. They're like CPUs that go in the server. Interesting. Um, interesting. It is. It is very interesting. Also, I mm -hmm. noticed like uh, either that's a small wafer or those are really big dies. They're, it's 400 millimeter square dies. Well, those are pretty Ooh. big dies. Um, I mean, I think that's kind of a little bit of Photoshop there because it's all skewed and nasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still a 400 millimeter square die. But what do you get with that 400 millimeter square? Well, uh, you get 60 megs of RAM of, of uh, L3 cache. Uh huh. You get 24 megs of L2 cache. This is a six channel you DDR4 get 48 controller. 48 cores. Yep. 48 mm -hmm. cores, six channel DDR. Four, 32 yeah, lanes at, of PCIe. Uh, 2667. All right. 120 watts. Only 120 watts, and it's one of the Only first 120 chips. watts. <laughs> On Samsung's new 10 nanometer process node. That's way fewer nanometers than the competition. <laughs> way fewer. Uh, it's pretty low. But of course, you know, we can argue ad nauseum about what 10 man nanometer <laughs> means versus 14 well, nanometer. Well, I mean, at this point, it's effectively 10 let's nanometers, not go there. right? Like, you know, basically. Yeah, whatever. But uh, runs at uh, 2.6 gigahertz max. Base clock, only 2.2. It's kind of amazing. Now, uh, throughput looks to be pretty impressive. Do, do we know if that max Still, clock is done per core, or is that a overall chip max clock? Sure. I don't think we have. We that don't know yet. Info. Okay. I mean, if the base is two point two, you would presume that it could get to two point six on all yeah. of them. Yeah. Well, in certain scenarios, or at least, or at least uh, within yeah. the TDP or whatever, you know. But, yeah. It's just not very often you're going to be pegging 48 cores. No, yeah. probably not. Yeah, but I mean, the workloads do exist, and especially for what this is going to be used for. It's the Falcor core. Falcor. Is that the is Falcor. that the flying is that the flying puppy dog from? Uh... <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Oh wow! Never-ending story. That, that's the best code name ever. All right. They should have photoshopped Falcor in there with the with the die shot. They're, they're waiting for the next generation. What's the, what's the uh, name of the stone the giant on the tricycle? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, impressive specs for a server for a compute where you need, you know, just crap loads of cores and threads, right? Uh, no hyper-threading. Just straight, you know, one core per thread. And that's okay. Yeah, and 120 watts, that's... It's low. That's kind of impressive. I yeah. mean, if you look at uh, some Intel stuff, like uh, they're... Oh, what is it? Uh, they're 20 core and 24 core, which are hyper threaded. You're looking at 150 to 180 watts, mm -hmm. if not higher. So they're yeah, uh, like they're the 8180 is 205. Yeah. Hmm. But I mean, it's always. But, uh, you know, they, they implemented a ring bus. Um, they got a ton of L3 cache, like I mentioned. Yep. It's a bi directional uh, ring bus, like Intel style. Yeah. Oh, older Intel style. But, Intel's moved on from that recently. Yeah. Yeah. They went to a more networked yeah, type. Yeah. Mesh. 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 Yeah. But, I've been but yeah, there's. Uh, we had the promise. From AM Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah. For quite a while, because it's two completely different ways of trying to get to the server room. Intel and AMD have always been very high power parts, but they need to try to figure out how to make them draw less power, especially as the cores ramp up. Qualcomm, on the other hand, has been pulling a wad or two and now has to figure out, okay, how do we get more powerful? How do we build something that can actually use more wattage so we can hit it into the server room? And so we're finally starting to see them meet towards in the middle um, where... You know, up until now, Intel and AMD have certainly had the power, uh, processing power, as opposed to the voltage power, a, a huge advantage uh, versus Qualcomm's initial 
and they've never really put out uh, a product. They've put out demonstrations. We've been hearing about Centric for it must be at least a year and a half now. And now, like looking at this, and of course we don't have benchmarks, so we don't know exactly how well implemented this is. But just looking at the raw statistics, Intel might be a little bit worried right now because that's going to be really, really cheap to run if it works well, even close to what uh, an Intel will. Right now, they're, it seems like people are just still kicking the tires on this because the amount of software infrastructure you've got to have to be able to run this effectively yeah. and in something that they feel is secure, and not only that, but will not crash, I mean, that's... That is a tremendous amount of development and testing and QC time that uh, that a company is willing to to have to do to implement this. And so, yeah, they're getting a savings per chip as compared to Intel. But getting to there is going to be a long road for Qualcomm and its partners, and mm-hmm. it's all going to be around software and OS. It, it, it um, almost seems, virtualization. It, like, like if you're a CenturyLink and you're like, all right, I got to fill up a data center. Uh, so, what can you guys do, Qualcomm? Can you set me up with stuff that I can do virtualization on and run just about whatever the hell my client needs on it? Or do I have to tell my clients, okay, there's changes you have to make on your end? Because if they can do it, so that the client doesn't really have to make any changes or doesn't see any changes, like. Places like that are going to go ape shit for this. Well, hasn't there been? There's been a couple, like not even third party. I want to say like fourth party hosting companies that do alternative architecture hosting. Um, like VPS is really cheap. You know, like three bucks a month for an ARM based, you know, virtualization server. Um, Jeremy, you kind of touched on a good point there because it, it's really easy to to deploy to a you know, a, a nice, fast, high-powered platform and then slap more virtual machines on it. Um, with these small, small cores and a bunch of them, you know, where where's the, the workload where you can bring in a client in that hosted environment and have that work better than the existing hardware? You know, I... It's really, really interesting, but I'm kind of at a loss where this fits in. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, AMD had a tremendous amount of experience with servers with their Opteron. I mean, they mm-hmm. they grabbed a pretty good and significant chunk of uh, market share with that when it was introduced in 2003, 2004. Mm-hmm. And they purchased CMicro, remember? And they were going to do the ARM stuff and the servers and the really dense things. What happened to C-Micro? They sold it. Never made any money. The hurdles towards acceptance were just seemingly too high. When's the last time you heard about the AMD K12? <laughs> Actually, chat was just talking about it before the podcast. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you talk about <laughs> yeah. weird stuff, Alex. Well, yeah. Um well, we were talking earlier. Bef- go, go ahead, ahead Josh. All right. Um, no, go ahead. I mean, I really well, we were talking about this, this this AMD Intel stuff prior over the past couple of days when it was coming out, um, and there was sort of a an undercurrent saying that Apple did this. This is Apple's hand behind the scenes, you know, pushing him towards this. Um, and then there was this sort of not even a rumor, but more just a you know conjecture that. Maybe Apple's pushing actually to move more towards ARM across the board. They already have their the Cortex line. They have the the information in house. They have the experience in house now. Um, would this fit into their master plan somehow? Maybe, maybe down the road, certainly. But it's going to be a while. Mm-hmm. There's just it's again it's uh, the, you know they've got all of this experience on iOS with ARM, but Mac OS is still BSD based. They've got a tremendous amount of uh, you know software, and certainly if there was one company who could change from one architecture <laughs> to another, it's it's Apple with PowerPC to to x86. 
But they rely on Intel a lot, and Intel is able to do a lot of interesting things, I think, for them mm-hmm. in terms of you know making product whenever they need it, and and you know having some flexibility there and adding features as needed, uh, not only to the CPUs but but to the uh, the I/O uh, stuff and their South bridges, and yeah, I think it 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 probably is is fair to say that Apple had something to say about Intel really upping their game in graphics and you know just so happens that apple is a close partner with amd in terms of graphics and intel is their cpu supplier for anything mac you know it's it's like chocolate and peanut butter to them <laughs> to apple why not just put one now they can buy it from one person product on on one substrate that has both of them together in a way that uh, fits apple's needs and and their Cabby Lake G stuff is is just exactly that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what about everyone's favorite abusive internet relationship? Paul Cobb and Ample can't split up. I, I need to read about new <laughs> lawsuits constantly. Oh, I think you'll be reading <laughs> about those the Apple next decade at boring. least. That's not enough. I need Qualcomm and Apple at each other constantly. Ah. It, it, it's one of those relationships where it's just so abusive, you're not sure it's ever going to end. Yeah, But we'll see. It seems like for Qualcomm, this is such, it's kind of almost the most difficult market to get into because, again, there's such a long tail on this stuff. Someone like, it's like Jeremy's example of CenturyLink might buy like, I don't know, a couple racks full of these to mess around with, but they're not going to fill a data center until the second and the third generation until it's actually proven to be around for yeah. long enough for them to invest mm-hmm. invest in the art in the architecture. But you got to start it. somewhere. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Qualcomm's been around the block. You know, no one's going to say, "Oh, they can't make chips." I mean, sure, but they could get <laughs> bored with this market pretty right. quickly, right? Like I don't know. Yeah. It, it it's definitely an interesting product. Yeah. I I kind of want to keep an eye on this because I think it's really cool. Yeah, be cool to get our hands on one of these uh, server equipment. Yeah, I don't would, know that if would we be will. nice. I that think Brian really should nice. work on that. That'd be fun. We've got plenty of space in the rack. Yeah, you know exactly. it'd also be cool to get our hands on. Ryan is definitely trying to get his hands on this. We know oh, Ryan's trying to get his hands on this. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Hey, you remember that tease last week of a new thing from NVIDIA? Yeah. And it had the Titan branding on it? Yeah. And people thought it was going to be cool and exciting? Yeah. Well, it is, but not not quite in the not way. Not the kind of cool and exciting you might yeah. have expected. Um, so, Light and Dark Side Collector's Edition Titan XPs. Uh, well, Titan X Pascal, right? No. Titan no? XPs. Oh, the real XP. Sorry. Yeah. The second yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Pre-order November 8th, and there's, like, the light side and the dark side. Yeah, so pre-orders went up today. You have to do it through GFE, so you have to have a GeForce graphics card installed on your computer you're trying to pre-order it on. Oh. Which is what Ryan was running into because he's (laughs) away from work using a ThinkPad. That's true. (laughs) So he couldn't get into GFE to pre-order one of these. Was he trying to pre-order one of each? Probably. It wouldn't surprise me. Because if you were ever wanted to SLI a pair of graphics cards... Yeah. They'd never get along. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, can, always, can you SLI those? those? <laughs> what, what color would you make the LED on the bridge? Um, Gray. <laughs> yeah, just, or just wait, white. wait, that got deprecated with the retcon, didn't it? No. There are uh, no more gray Jedis. Yeah, now, Jim, yeah. as the only one here who's ever bought a Titan, uh-huh. how do you feel about these cards? You've bought two. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. How do you, I, how I, do you feel about this? Is it comfortable this? to sleep on? Does well, your wife like yours it? Yours were what? Yes. Were yours the Pascals or the XPs? Uh, Pat, well, so I bought first gen Pascal. Okay. This is the this is the third Titan release Pascal, third Pascal based Titan release, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I bought the I bought the one that they nicknamed that the, the community nicknamed Titan XP. Right. Then 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 they came out with the actual Titan XP, and now this. So yeah. Uh, I mean, they're they're selling. I mean, they're selling. It's the same exact specs as the current Titan yeah. XP. They're not going to make a yeah. lot. They're of not these. making a lot. You have yeah. to buy them direct through through. Yeah. Uh, not only just direct through NVIDIA, but direct through GeForce Experience app. Isn't um, it only supposed to be like like five hundred so each if, or something? If, if you were going to buy one, and you're into Star Wars, great. Uh, it's not a you know it's not a huge deal uh, for the, the market. Yeah, yeah. Um, it looks cool. 
They do look cool. It should at least come with a Battlefront 2 CD key. <laughs> yes, my God. That's what I was kind yeah, of expecting. Bucks pop. Yeah, you better get some, give them some incentive. Yeah. Because, I mean, I thought even the PR was talking about, yeah, you could play your favorite Star Wars game and da da da. Like, well, I mean, that that's obviously like, I'm, I'm sure that's how they got their door in to do these is by, is with e, through EA and. Uh, Battlefront. Being do you think they if you put them together like that? Do you get does the lightsaber actually happen? Like <laughs> sure, why not? One well, way to find out, Alan. Give me your credit card. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I know. Actually, I don't know. You might be maxed out on mining equipment. Probably. But, probably. <laughs> I mean, do you think that that Nvidia set out to pursue this branding, or do you think they had a bunch of GP one hundred two Titan XPs sitting around, and they're like, let's just put a new, you know, slightly redesigned chassis on them? Either. Both. I mean, their sales are probably the sales are probably starting to fall off a little on these because you got you know 1080 Ti is pretty good. And didn't they add extra I mean, the functionality? 1080 Ti. Mm -hmm. So did the, Nvidia recently add like more compute stuff to their? What? They they, they, huh? they changed their driver to increase performance in certain computing yeah. compute applications. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for it, the to TI. counter to counter AMD right, which kind of like meant you could do some of that compute with non Titan X slash XP cards, like mm -hmm. you could do it with lower end cards right so people might just be buying like 1080 ti's and stuff to do that same stuff with mm -hmm. and you know and getting away with it possibly well, i mean if if you're gaming there's no need to there's no reason to that not too. go with yeah. a 1080 ti if you're professional applications and you're serious about it you're probably going to want application certification so you're probably going to want to go quadro right i mean the, the titan line has always been sort of the bastard child <laughs> Well, that, I mean, it's it, it's a it's a very niche specialized product, which is why they don't let their OEMs sell it. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's 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 the you pay us a lot more money to get the extra five percent. Yes, yeah. if you need the most powerful single GPU for some reason. Now, when I bought mine, it was because it was the twelve gigs of RAM, and at the time, the GTX ten eighty only offered eight. Yeah, so that's why I went with mine. Yep, but now with the ten eighty Ti at eleven mm -hmm. gigs of memory, so that that's the there is. I mean, nobody in nobody in the right mind should buy this card. That's, <laughs> That's it's, it's, Brian it's really two. cool. And Ryan, Ryan will probably talk two. himself into getting one, um, and then he'll bitch about it for two weeks. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's a cool thing. But there's no there's no sense in that. Unless I hate you, to say unless it, you were already going to buy a Titan XP. Ryan's for another Ryan's reason. just going to treat it as if it is a limited edition 500, uh, you know, one of 500 piece of art. And oh, yeah, probably that, just, if Ryan buys two of those, just, they're not going in a PC. Yeah, they're just they're, gonna, they're going on that set. They'll over get there. framed over there yeah, next yeah. to the lightsaber. You can't, the audience can't really tell. It's that filthy analyst lucre <laughs> that is that is causing him to buy these things. <laughs> yeah, he's never yeah. had a problem buying random shit before. Since he started his before. recent Disney kick, there's this office is filling up with Star Wars memorabilia. It, it see, has. He's having drop ship straight from Walt Disney World. Well, see, it was he goes and picks it up now oh does he yeah he personally he's going down there all the time it, he was always yeah. like that with star wars stuff there was just less of it until the disney train and there was came disney up, came and he had a child so it's just this huge you know and then his and then his daughter walks in the office and picks up the the tie fighter off your desk and goes tie fighter you mm -hmm. know and just like yeah that really she's how I mean, old you know as a father of a five-year-old <laughs> like who is not interested at all in star wars despite my best efforts it does warm my heart to see emmeline at, at two and a half yeah say millennium falcon yeah <laughs> yeah i couldn't spell that till i was 13 well this kid's uh you know yeah she's she's, she's Ryan, got ryan's the, doing something right she's drinking I mean, he's doing a lot wrong, but he's doing something right <laughs> basically yeah Brutal, man. Well, Jacob, Brutal. If you're watching this. You know, speaking of you Disney, you need to come out with a new uh, set of uh, SLI bridges. Oh, Make yeah. them look like the old style ribbon cables and clearly label them master and ah, apprentice. And apprentice. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. And send, then, me, send me the royalties. And then all the master Star Wars fans. And slave Leia. And then, and no, then all the Star right. Wars fans just took out a Sharpie and some ribbons. Isn't, isn't like in the next two years, Mickey Mouse? Is going to become public domain? No, no I don't no. think it's ever no, going to become public domain. And never happened. That's almost happened like a dozen times in the last forty years, and Congress yeah. keeps extending it. Yeah, the Sunny Bono. Yeah, law. isn't it like every five years it comes up? Uh, no, I mean it depends because each time they've extended it, it's been for a different period of time. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, it, that it'll never. Mickey Mouse and certain corrupt members of Congress are the reason why <laughs> nothing is in <added laughs> public domain in thirty years, right? been like something like the 80s it's been stretched yeah, it's way been beyond a long, 30, long time i think 
Yeah, because like initially it was like death of the author. Plus me, 70. Yep. Plus some years now, and now it's, it's up like 90. Plus yeah. 90 and plus there's some certain stipulations. If it was used after the author died by a registered agent of the author, then that extends it. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's ad infinitum. Yeah. Yeah. And there's the mouse clause if you need it. Yeah. Yeah. I I hate Disney now. <sighs> oh, you should. Oh, did uh, I say that? Oh, oh. No, Sorry. no. I just, I, we don't know what Jeremy's talking about. Don't He's acting us. alone. Don't kill us. He's a Canadian. <laughs> he doesn't understand Jeez. how things are go done get him. in Man, the I'm United to go, States. I'm about to fix all this stuff up in post. <laughs> or we're going to get like takedown notices right after we post. What? From me talking like Mickey for a second? Oh, yeah. We're going to get a takedown for that. That'd be impressive. Oh, yeah. Just do the yeah. whole podcast in the voice of Mickey. Oh, yeah. Well, what would happen? Fans actually got the email right now. Michael Eisner would come and shoot you in the head. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I He's got him. some free time now. He's not CEO anymore. Oh, that's right. Who's the CEO now? Bob Iger. Iger. Some Iger. female gal. But it's always it's always better to make fun of Michael Eisner. No, no Josh, uh, Ka- Kathleen Kennedy is just running Lucasfilm. Or I mean, she's doing more than that. But she's she's uh, she's in control of Star Wars for Disney. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Taught an electronics yeah, troubleshooting she- class, and the voice of Strong Bad once. Moving oh. on, uh, you know what Strongbed likes? VPNs. Amplify. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Amplify. Sorry. Jim, you wrote about this. Yeah. Tell us about it. Yeah, so Am- Amplify, uh, which we talked about earlier this year when we kind of did our mesh Wi-Fi or mesh networking roundup, uh, Amplify is the, the consumer brand of Ubiquity, which we've also talked about because we're using some of their products here in our, ne- our network. So Ubiquity is enterprise focused, Amplify is consumer focused, and they um, yesterday was it? What day is today? Yeah, I mean, it was yesterday. Uh, announced this um, this device called Teleport, which is a sort of plug and play VPN like device that if you travel, you have to have their router at home, and then you take this thing with you. Plug it in when you get to the hotel, either connect it through Wi-Fi or Ethernet to the public hotel Wi-Fi or wherever you are, the public Wi-Fi, and then connect your device to this thing. And now you are securely connected to your home network. And so that not only lets you browse privately and securely, because sometimes public networks are not safe, uh, but it also gives you access uh, to your home network resources as if you were at home. So if you have a NAS in your home, you can access that. If you've got other file shares, if you uh, are traveling uh, overseas and everything on Netflix is blacked out, you connect through this and Netflix, as far as it's concerned, says you're home. And so you get access to your, your, you know, whatever you'd get at home, same with sports and blackouts and things like that. So it's really neat. If you're familiar with VPNs, it's, it's, it's basically a hardware plug and play VPN type thing. We don't know specifically what the encryption is it's using to connect. So we don't know if it's using one of the standard VPN protocols or, uh, if it's, uh, something special that ubiquity baked up uh but uh we're going to find that out but as, as you know as we as of now all we know is it's an encrypted connection uh to your home it's uh on kickstarter which is interesting because this is a big company they shouldn't really need to rely on kickstarter yeah, that's no. kind of weird yeah, yeah. uh but there, yeah, it's a low it's a cool thing nowadays <laughs> yeah I mean, the, the the goal i think is 50,000 uh so they're probably going to hit that so it's low so you know i guess Whatever, but uh, if you go through Kickstarter and you're one of the first uh, to do it, uh, it's one ninety nine, and then there's like a second round of early bird where it goes up another thirty bucks. And Alan broke Kickstarter. Yeah, um, <laughs> finally someone broke. There we go. <laughs> Hooray! And uh, and then I think the final price was two sixty nine, and that gets you the the router, which prior to this was the base of their mesh networking system. It works on its own as a Wi Fi router. Uh, but you can then connect the mesh points to it. So you get that and the teleport. And then if you want, you can extend it with mesh access points at your house if you want the full, you know, mesh uh, experience. Uh, but it's it's a neat device. It is a little costly. It, you know, if you, if you know about VPNs, you know, a lot of routers have VPN servers built in. Uh, you can it, subscribe to VPN services. Some are free, some are cheap. Uh, it's not really worth it, but if you're if you're not into that, if you don't want to worry about that, you just kind of want a plug and play solution, and you do travel a lot. It's it's probably something to consider. Uh, like I said, you do have to move your network at home over to Amplify System because it has to be acting as your router at the house for this all to work. But uh, but it's not a bad. I mean, in our experience, when we tested it, Eero, which is another mesh company, came out on top 
a little bit in our experience, but the Amplify system was still pretty great. So that's not really a negative to use that as your router uh, if you have to make that switch. Looks like a prerequisite to ownership is uh, you have to have a bunch of IKEA furniture. Sure, yes. Oh, we'll send our sample to Sebastian. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and as far as we can tell, there's no there's no fees. Like, there's no subscriptions. There's no you know, monthly fee you have to pay to use it. Once you buy the hardware, that's it. Uh, of course, it also means that it's reliant on your network connection. So yeah. if you've got crappy networking at the hotel you're at or if your upload speed at the house is is terrible, this isn't going to do much for you. Um, but if you've got decent network connection in both both points, uh, it, it, it's a, it's an interesting device. We've asked them to send us one. Uh, it's going to be shipping in December, and they said they'll get us one closer to that ship date. So we'll get it in, and we'll, we'll take a look and see, you know, see how it works in practice. But on paper, uh, something to keep an eye on. Interestingly enough, it's something that would actually be really useful to us here, but we're Why? using... Why? The Plex U- server's never up anyways. We're using Ubiquity products instead of Amplify products, so... <laughs> Yeah, we have to do it the hard way. Yeah, and VPN isn't hard. No, it but, just it can get a little complicated okay. in certain. So, areas. so let's go into the woods a little here. The issue we've had with VPN is that our internal network is one nine two one six eight one dot x, and that's you know, what, where all of our same, networks are at home. Yeah, you can't use the same subnet on the remote end. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. I wonder if they get around with this thing. Somehow. They do because you bring a piece of hardware with you that right. you connect through. Right. Yeah. So. Well, I imagine it, they get around that. And if it's using, yeah. it's saying it's zero configuration. If it's going back to the base station at your house, it's going to know what subnet it is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so the actual it address it gives. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're connected to the device. So it's like they could make it some random subnet that doesn't conflict with their Amplify yeah. stuff. Because you probably can't, you know, I don't even know if you can change the subnet on your Amplify router. Um, I think I would, it's, you, you get a choice. It's like yeah, you can okay. choose between 169 and 10.1. Yeah. 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 So, well, it's it's certainly interesting if if you have like a file server at home and you travel a lot. I think it's a pretty good idea, especially since you get a solid Wi-Fi system out of it. Yeah. One of the other mm-hmm. points this, this doesn't apply to me, but and to a lot of us. But they said you know if you have multiple houses, you got a vacation home, or you have <laughs> multiple houses. As you do, you plug one in at the second house or the vacation home. And you can share the same resources. So no matter where you are, hmm. you always have your file share available. You always have the same Netflix content. You can always watch your sports team through MLB or NHL or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's that's pretty neat. But again, only if you have good network connection. Yeah, you need a solid network connection yeah. at, at home base. This isn't going to do miracles if you're on crappy three megabit dial-up or, or uh, DSL, rather. Uh, well, the other thing to consider is... Make sure you've is, got the upload speed. Yeah, upstream yeah. is usually, you know, what's not great. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've got 300 megabit, but my upstream is only like 10 or something. 20. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> it's not great. Can you no, tell compared we're all to what the on the same is. internet plan? Yeah. All <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, say you were traveling to China and you wanted to play StarCraft Two on your VPN. Well, you're certainly going to need a VPN. Um, um, yeah. See, that's where I was going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, StarCraft Two is going free to play November 11th or 14th. Would you look at that? Yeah. So this gets you access to multiplayer, including rank matches, which is cool. Yeah. Some of the co-op missions and the Wings of Liberty campaign, which I think is the first one, the Terran campaign. Sweet. Yep. And uh, this is really cool. If you already own Wings of Liberty, like I did, because I bought StarCraft II when it first came out in the first in the first iteration, mm-hmm. they're actually giving you the second campaign for free. So you Sweet. Get the, so you get the, uh, I think it's the... Uh, Oh, Heart the of Zerg. The, yeah, the Zerg campaign. So they still make sure to give you something. Yeah, that's just like a small little detail that I would never expect. Right. It looks like you do have to claim that between today and December 8th, so in the next month. So I need to log in and do that. But yeah, it's cool that they pay attention to the people that kind of bought StarCraft 2 and then forgot about the other two campaigns coming out like I did. Hmm. Cool. You should I play StarCraft 2. I got bored of the... Uh, well, the last one, I never actually finished the Protoss. Yeah. Should do that one day. The story goes places from what I've seen. Not that you're necessarily in StarCraft for the story, but it goes some very interesting places. It's apparently worth seeing I'm, through. All right. Just there for the, the cutscenes. <laughs> I love you, Sarge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Doke. Uh, in other rumors... 
Google Pixel 2 XL is slow to charge, supposedly. Among other issues. Among other issues. Been having. Uh, do we have one of these? Does somebody uh, we know have one of these? Uh, uh, no, we don't have any hands-on with one of these, but I've, this has essentially been confirmed at this point. It only charges at a max of 10 and a half watts. That doesn't seem like fast charging to me. No, and the Pixel 1 had fast charging. So... Fast charging but is... But if you, you charge it too fast, then that burns into the screen, and, well, <laughs> they already, you got more problems. Yeah, well, how many, watt hours, how many watt hours is the battery? I don't remember, but... Oh, when the screen is on, it drops to six. Yeah, because it's, I mean, it's using power. Well, does that mean that it's only drawing six still, and meaning that the screen is taking some of that away, and so you're charging the battery at even less than six? Because yep. you could only measure it at the input. Uh, click on that Google Plus link just right. to make so, sure how he measured it. Now he used a multimeter in line, so yeah. Multimeter in line, just with the USB cable. Yeah. Where, where is this thing? Wait, is this the guy who did all the Amazon Type C? I believe it is, which is why this. Oh, is, okay. This is a very important thing, or at least he's he's been doing a lot of this stuff recently. Yeah. I scrolled through his Google Plus page. Oh yeah, this is the guy whose Pixel Book got blowed up. Yeah. So this is definitely someone I charge or it's trust, not charge. Uh, uh, heavy while charging. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Yeah. So it might be doing that for like thermal concerns. In other words, it might be, it might pull itself back to six watts because the screen is on. Because the screen's heat. on and the yeah. CPU is doing yeah. stuff, and so it's like a thermal envelope, like pre-programmed thing, right? Yeah. Um, which I could see someone doing, but that means, uh, yeah. So the input will go up to eleven watts from six. Yeah, that's um. Yeah, only two watts is directed to the battery. So there you go. If you're that's using it while it's plugged rough. in, yeah, the don't do that. That charge rate is not, almost nothing. Yeah, like, that's just and, and like he says, if you're using screen on, if you're doing GPS in the car, you're depleting your battery. That's true. Like, wow, that's kind of an issue. Yeah, I haven't had that kind of an issue since like I had like an iPhone 3G or something, and one of those car stereos with the USB port on it that only charged at 500 milliamps. At, at 500 milliamps. Yeah. And then that would, like, lose charge if you were GPSing at the same time. It would barely break even, right? Yeah. How can you be at that point with the phone today? That's uh, just the, the, the crazy. The Pixel 2XL in particular has had some issues, we'll say. I, I Anecdotally, I know people with them. I have a friend who has one he really likes, hasn't really run into any issues. So, I mean, it's not necessarily deal breakers, depending on... Yeah, it's just something to consider yeah. if you're heavy, you know, if your use case involves, you know, trying to use the phone and have it plugged in. and yeah, Just good stuff to know. That if you're depending on fast charging, maybe go look at another phone. So does that phone just not support the higher voltage, or is it just that... Uh, well, the original Pixel did 5 volt, 3 amp. Oh, and this okay. one seems to not be negotiating at that. Well, Kyle in the chat says his is charged fine. Well, So there might be... Yeah. There might be something, some detail we're missing some here. Hardware. Kyle yeah. hasn't put his on a meter yet. I'd be interesting, interested to see if he does that. What he comes out with. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you'd have to be like trying to use it while it was plugged in, and then be paying attention. Well, he's to saying he uses in the car with GPS, and oh. it, it, well, it's gets, the damn it, it gets car he drives. Charge. It's overpowered in every single way. He's just got the AC cranked, keeping the phone nice and cool. Yeah, right yeah. From the vent. <laughs> yeah. You know, because he's down there, down south, where it's probably still hot. Always hot. <sighs> All right. Uh, that, I think that's it for the news, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, hardware, software picks. Unless anybody's got anything else before we move on. I got none. None? None? None for the past 20 years. So uh, I got an email today, <laughs> and like Samsung's been doing a bunch of sales on TVs lately. Like It was like a few weeks ago I got an email about like some sales, and then those ended, and then I just today I got another email from them, and like, hey, it's there's more TVs. That time sale. of year. And I'm flipping through the, 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 you know, scrolling down the email and just a, basically a list of all their, you know, whatever models are on sale. And this one caught my eye. Um, it's their current generation. This is not, uh, it's 4K, but it's not, um, not HDR. And it's not like LED. No, you it know, is HDR. It's not, is it HDR? Yeah. And it's LED. For only 3300 I, I pray to God that it's HDR. I was trying to say it's not a OLED. But, um, no. but here's the thing, thirty it's thirty three hundred bucks for the eighty two inch model. 
That's a big F in TV. It's I mean, taller than I've you. Seen bigger. Holy crap. <laughs> like, it's just that usually when you hit that size class of the TV, that's you, a lot of glass. The prices are usually much higher than that. That's just surprisingly low for the size of that screen. Yeah. Um, like, I don't have a wall in my house that would fit on. Yeah, absolutely that's the thing. not. Like, even I the, don't have a car I could transport that in. Oh, no. So, like, seven, I couldn't you get go to Best Buy that. and pick it up yeah. because I couldn't get it home. Yeah, that was the other thing. Like, Ken was saying, <laughs> Ken looked up Best Buy like, Amazon, immediately. Amazon, can like, I get this one by a drone, yeah, please? Like, hey, I would just want to pick this up locally, you know. And, for, first of all, they didn't seem to stock it regularly in our store, which makes sense. I think it was... Well, it's not that it was recently launched. I just don't think they they were previously moving that many of them. But like, I think the normal price on it was like five or six grand or something. Yeah. So to come down to that that price, holy crap! Yeah. And that's I mean, pretty impressive. If you look at the the prices for the more normally sized sets, they're pretty good. Yeah, they're also pretty good. Now this set, uh, like if you're uh, you know stickler for detail on like what the actual reproduction and contrast and all that. It's the not other necessarily stuff. the best. TV you can buy right now. The, yeah. the OLEDs are better. The 2016 8000 series is actually a little better in color reproduction in some areas. Yep. But I mean, but they're, they're difficult inches. to find now because they're they're old sets. The LG C7 OLEDs have been on sale, but it's still like 15 1600 bucks for 55 inch slash uh, like 2300 bucks for 65 inch. I think so. Yeah. This is a pretty good deal. Just trying to picture like what. What size is that LG set? Is that 65? Yeah, it's 65. Yep. So it's only a 65. 82. That's huge. Only yeah. a 65. 82. Well, yeah, I, I have a 50 at home. I'm like, yeah, I got a 55 in my living room. And yeah. it, I think I have. Hours I cannot imagine having a 65 inch TV, at least. In no, where you, I have you know what size my TVs me. are? I think mine's a 55 or mine might be a 60. Uh, it's probably a 55. Both of mine are 32 yeah. inch. Yeah. Yeah. Just because. It's more than you can fit four of those in the 82. Takes a brave man to admit that. (laughs) Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, but just, you know, I'm just used to seeing anytime you get like over 70 inches on a TV, that's why the prices are going up into like, you know, 10K or something crazy. Yeah, just usually it's just this exponential increase where this is kind of linear. I mean, sort of. Well, the 65 inch is obviously the best deal. Yeah, the 65 the is a good deal. It's like 1500 bucks for a 65. Because you jump up another grand to get the 75 inch. Yeah. And then... And then it's less. It's like... Yeah. It's like f- almost 500 more to go from 75 to yeah. 82. And 49 to 55 is only a couple hundred bucks. So the 55 and the 65 would be the ones to get. Because those are normal TV sizes that people <laughs> <Yeah>. buy. <laughs> Weird. Uh, anyway, uh, seems like, uh, something worth looking into if you're TV shopping. Uh, what we got next? Who's next? Jeremy has a now? pick we mean? with no it's, photos it's, in it. It's Jer- Jeremy, you would pick something with no photos in it, wouldn't you? View full size. Well, I've, There's no picture. I've got an anti-pick. Hold on, let me, <laughs> let me refresh this page. There we go. Whoa, you picked a Logitech brick. Yes. Like, well, it's not yet the brick, but it will be very soon. Um, okay. Um, Does it have so wireless? So if you bought a Harmony Link... <laughs> oh, actually, the, don't you have the, one of these, Alan? I don't have a link. Oh, uh, you have the hub? Yeah. Okay. So the hub will keep going, but as of March 16th, something, uh, this brand new invention, which is called a technology certificate license, okay, will expire, <laughs> and you will no longer be able to use... Your Logitech Harmony Link, which didn't actually come with a contract or a monthly deal or anything like that. It's just Logitech's going to brick it on you. Oh, I bet those are terms of service you agreed to. I mean, what is, uh, well, what I'm is sure that supposed you read to deep do? Enough into it. The, the, the Harmony Link was the product before the Harmony Hub that did the same thing. Oh. The Harmony Hub superseded it. Okay. Well, I thought the link was focused on So it was like a multifunction the... remote, but it would link together uh, your cell phone, a bunch of your different uh, boxes. Yeah, but a little more effectively than you know your Radio Shack uh, old multi remote. Sure. And so, yeah, uh, for a completely and totally made up reason, it's just not going to work anymore. Oh, but hey, wait. Uh, which also raises the question of how exactly it is that they're going to stop it from working. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But they say so, so. If you have one that's under warranty, you get a free upgrade to a hub. 
Yeah. For the next two or three years until they kill that one. And then if it's out of warranty, you get 35% I, off. But I imagine like none of these are still on warranty. Like how long of a warranty yeah, could a they possibly warranty. have Yeah, you would have, you would have, I've had, I've had the hub for three years ago. Yeah. yeah, I've had the hub for like almost yeah. three years now. No, apparently there is, uh, there were a couple, you know, going, someone found them in the back of a shack somewhere <laughs> and they're selling them on yeah. discount on uh, Amazon or Newegg. So in theory, you could still have a disc, uh, still have a warranty. Okay. It's very unlikely. And I think with this coming on, you know, maybe you might not want to pick up that hub. No, yeah. probably not. This is do, a little Do you see what Logitech and... science gets you? My experience with the <laughs> yeah. hub has been kind of spotty. Like, but when it's working, it's great. Like, when once you have it set up and everything, it's great. Yeah. But they, they take too much control, like, out of your hands. Like, I had to put in a support request to get a specific button mapping added to my like quote unquote profile for the yeah. hub. It, it programs itself for, it calls back to the mothership to program itself every time it reboots. Mm. Oh, well there you go. So they shut down the mothership and now it yeah, just it relies, it relies on nothing. Logitech. Like if Logitech service ever goes down, then the next time my power goes out, every hub on the planet well, will stupid. not work anymore. Cause it's, it's doesn't really like save anything. It has to get it from Logitech. Now there are other conveniences with that. Like I can pull up the harmony app on my phone right now, not even at my house and turn my TV off. But that doesn't mean that they have to reprogram itself every time it reboots. That's true. But it's like they made, it's like they made the hub too dumb. Yeah. I, right? I, I have one as well. And, and I'm not necessarily impressed with it as a device. I, I mean, don't necessarily there, think there's anything better currently, but there, there's a chance that it might keep the settings that are in it. But you would never be able to change anything yeah. ever again, like on it. If you got a new TV or something, you're just out of luck. Like oh, without, Alan, you'd be stuck with Windows service. Media Center yeah. forever. <laughs> hey, I wish I could get that back. I'm trying. I'm trying to cut like that cord, Windows man. Media Center. I'm really trying to cut that Media Center cord. I'm still on Media Center. Yeah, mm -hmm. we know. And cable right. card. God, it's like one well, of after ten that people. Yeah, yeah I don't diagram. blame you for sticking with a cable card. <laughs> yeah, that was quite the uh, epic. Yeah, and, and, and that's another thing. When it works, works really well. I'm, mm -hmm. I had to add a different service to get my guide to work now. Yeah. Huh. One day Satya Nadella is going to knock on your door and he's just going to start slapping you and just turn it off. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> we want it. We tried to I kill don't this want for it. ten years. You I bastard. don't want it. It's the, the, thou wife says. Wife says thou shalt watch news and whatever other television. Yeah, but there are other ways to. Oh, I've got a cable box I could plug in. Or any uh, TiVo, uh, nah. yeah, those TiVo's over the, the air DVRs with cable cards from still. Channel Master has one. Yeah, cable card. You make me sad every time I think about it. You have to use you. the uh, with the tuning adapter, like the separate box that does the digital channels. Yeah, and none of the Plex stuff will work with like the Time Warner cable channels, oh, other right, than. Yeah. Because like, Media Center is the only thing that can decrypt cable card. Yeah, yeah. It can decrypt the HD stuff. Yeah. So I can get locals yep. with Plex, probably even mm. with the hardware I already have. An SD. But they'll only be an SD, even though there are HD equivalents yeah. that are also just local stations. But they Do you really they need your local news in HD? Well, when you have a like 60-inch TV, you have you seen how bad eight, the SDR stuff well, looks? <laughs> oh, like fair a, enough. That's a fair point. Use, Letterbox the, use the Spectrum app. Uh, okay. Then you're still has... paying for cable, and paying for cable is stupid. Well, I'm just saying, right? But if if, if you still have to keep, <laughs> yeah, cable, yeah, I'm trying to make you it to don't the point need where I'm not it, paying people. for cable. Cut, just stop watching cable. You but don't this need isn't, it. This isn't his choice. It's true. He, he's under the the, the control. Yeah, of yeah. Another force and I almost like the YouTube TV thing, like mm -hmm. that almost saved me, but that doesn't have like you know a lot of the other channels she's watching on cable. Mm -hmm. So almost there, so close, so so close. Get so, so close. far away, so close. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. Well, hopefully my Harmony Hub doesn't turn into another Logitech brick anytime soon. You, you got a few years. Yeah. Uh, Josh. Me. What you got? A hundred bucks off Ryzen eighteen hundred X. That's twenty percent. Pretty off. good deal. Yeah, it's nice. And Ruby for Quake like Champions. Oh. Free champions pack for Quake Champions. Whatever yeah, that you means. Yeah, you get the special Ruby one. Ooh, that's nice. Anyway, you can get a Ruby eighteen hundred X three ninety nine, ninety nine. Ninety nine. Mm, 99. Thank you. <laughs> so take it. Yeah, yeah. if you're interested, it's in, a good uh, processor. You know, go to a CPU. That's a nice 
price. Pick up a motherboard for not a whole lot more. Whoa. Oh. That's the not that's the air cooler version, apparently. Well, only the 1700 as a 1700. bundle with the air cooler. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Rule the arena. Rule it. Rule it. Moving along. Ken, what you got? Uh, well, I came across this kind of randomly the other day, I think yesterday on Twitter, and it's a pretty cool wallet, simplistic wallet for electronics nerds like us, Alan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's essentially just two pieces of oh, FR4, but then they got cute with the silk screen on the back. Well, I guess the copper layer on the back. Actually, that's very useful. Yeah, so you can tell different package sizes. So if you're an E who's sitting all day at a bench and needs to look at uh, an 0608 versus a 12. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, whatever the other, 1206, then you Dude, just pull out your wallet. I, I didn't even see that on the back. Yeah. And it, it's nice one of those slim wallets, so you can just fit a couple cards in there, maybe some cash. Uh, it also blocks RFID. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. Also cool. Yeah. fourteen fifty five dollars $5 shipping on Tindy. That's not bad it, at all. And also, <laughs> alternate Dude, that's pick. money well spent. Yeah. If yeah. you've never been to it's, Tindy. It's got a ruler on it that goes to five inches, which is perfect for me. Wait, that's five, <laughs> extra semi, sorry, five <laughs> centimeters, Josh. <laughs> that's five on, centimeters. Josh, nobody's going to buy that. <laughs> Alan, don't Self spoil him. have been telling him the inches this whole time. I know. He's been going on that same thing all these years. <laughs> It's made me feel better on the inside. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. All right. <laughs> and okay. If you've never been to this website, Tindy, uh, just go to the homepage. It's a bunch of small run stuff that makers put on there. Oh. So just, just browse it for a little bit. There's Look all just watch. sorts of little random crap that people make as a hobby and they'll, they'll do a run of and, and post on there. That's pretty cool. Watch. Yeah. It's like the USB well, cable I checker. What was hilarious about it was funds from the sale of this project will go towards a complex soldering to- tutorial board to be announced soon. Oh. Like, so they're taking the profits of this to build a new project. And that's kind of cool. What is, is what is what's the beauty of hobby? What is this thing? And why won't it show me the picture? Work. Uh, picture. Well, because you've got to hack into it. Because <laughs> it's the super conference badge. <laughs> is it, look at that. Is that oh a yeah, screen? how can it goes friggin' all out on yeah. their badges? Is that a screen oh, on I the mean, badge? You were in the security profession at some point. Like, do you not under- know the inside baseball of conference badges? Oh, I and, know, and I know. I've seen like stuff. DefCon badges, but those yeah. were just like a PCB. Oh, they've got cool. they've gotten advanced. Anymore. Holy crap! And they're like open source designs for you to base your badge off of, so you can have a starting point if you're doing a smaller conference. That's pretty cool. Yeah. USB cable checker. Yeah, just just all sorts of cool. That's also random pretty crap. cool. She's got an LED for each wire. <laughs> How simple is that? Yeah, man. Right. You can you can you can spend a lot of a lot of money on this website. Yeah, yeah. You probably should <laughs> never never told me about this website. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to spend the money. So, I, so, so Ken, is this like a Kickstarter, or are these no, products no. that are in hand? They're just, that, no. that, that, like, so when you order it, you're definitely going to yeah, do it. Yeah, they're just I making mean, the, I, the I will it. say it might take a week for the guy to put it together, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's not like a pre-order system at all. Cool. I mean, that's 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 cool stuff. Yeah, there's just there's there's a lot of crap on there. All right, sweet. All right, uh, pcpro.com slash podcast. And, uh, you know, next week, uh, is the boss going to be back next week, I guess, I hope. I don't we know, never man. know. Well, maybe. Then the week after that is Thanksgiving. Oh, uh, that's true. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Can I just go hibernate for the winter? Sure. Uh, and then after that, I can't yell at people for playing Christmas music. Yeah. Uh, that's true. <laughs> my my neighbor Impressive. already has his Christmas decorations in full force. Yeah, but you're technically allowed to yell at them right now. Uh, I'm not going to yell at my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> We do live in Kentucky. We do. This he guy does. in the chant just mm-hmm. basically mm-hmm. chanting mm-hmm. over Point. the air HD. <laughs> and yes, that is my plan. Yeah. <sighs> anyway. All right. <laughs> uh, with that, I'm uh, Alan Momentano. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs>
No, I'm disgusted. Believe me. <laughs> good, good, goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Josh may not be here next week. 